Well, welcome everybody. I know it's a little, still a little early for some of us to be talking about such a thing, but um, I do hope you're in good voice because, as Stephen says, there are choruses coming up. <laughs> I want to just uh, say that um, I want to start with a little bit of context before I get onto the, the subject in hand, and just to say a little bit about Christmas music. Um, if you were to go anywhere in London, I'm sure you'd believe that only a very small number of carols exist in the world. You hear them on, all over the place, and, and that's what we think. You know, time and time again, we hear these every year, the same sort of carols. Um, but I think singing at Christmas is actually as old as Christmas itself, pretty much. So that's a very, very long time for this material to be out in circulation. Now, clearly, initially, we're talking about singing in church at the Christmas um, period. And in England, this stopped during the Reformation for a period of time, as you probably know. And um, from um, about um, 1780, really, um, at that time, the only carol that really was sung in churches was Welsh Shepherds. That was the only one that was kind of accepted in Anglican services until we get later the Victorian period. And that's when Christmas takes off, doesn't it? With Dickens and Christmas cards and Christmas trees. And we start to sort of almost create a, a caroling culture in a church context. However, in parallel to all this church music, these church carols, there is a separate line of development, and that is traditional and folk carols. And this is really what I want to focus on today. It's not what was sung per se inside the church, it's what the people were singing outside. Okay, we're going to start by thinking about folk carols. What do I mean by this? And I mean these are the carols collected from the mouths of the people. So they've been passed down through families, through communities, through what we know as oral transmission. Um, not written down until a raft of posse, actually, of Victorian Edwardian collectors started going to find them. So this is a bit of sort of university challenge. I need you to name these people. Here we go. This is your start of a 10, ladies and gentlemen. Who is this? Oh, top of the class, those girls over there. This is Wraith for Williams indeed. He was collecting in Sussex, and we'll be finding a little bit more about uh, particularly one of the carols he, he collected. Good guess, but not Lucy. This is Janet Blunt. She was in Adderbury in Oxfordshire, and she was collecting folklore and traditions around and about, including Morris tunes as, as well as dances and songs. Oh, yes. Sabine Bearing Gould. This is the vicar of Lou Trenchard in Devon. He was collecting on Exmoor. Um, some of you will recognise him. Very interesting character indeed. If I was to go, da 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 There we are. He made a lot of money, I think, out of that Morris dance tune. That's English Country Gardens and Percy Granger. This is a lady called Miss Gilchrist, who was working up in the northwest of England, just to show that men and women were, were very much engaged in this, this activity at the time. These are three brothers from uh, Dorset. These are the Hammond brothers who were collecting down there. They were also um, active in Somerset. We've had her name. Folk collecting is tiring, as you see. We've got <laughs> Lucy Broadwood here taking a rest. Um, and she's of the Broadwood uh, piano manufacturing family down in Sussex. So Lucy Broadwood, founder member of the Folk Song Society and very active collector, as were her uncles before her in the mid-19th century. So we've got all these people collecting, looking for folk songs, and amongst that um, wonderful collection of material, they're finding carols. But perhaps the greatest of them all is this gentleman. This is Cecil Sharp, a London-based music teacher. You've all no doubt heard of Cecil Sharp. Here he is on his bicycle, about to go off collecting. You'll probably look, he's got his notepad in his pocket, ready to go. Um, he's uh, actually probably got his camera in the other pocket. Um, that's not true, someone's taking this photograph, probably using his camera. Um, he took photographs of his singers as well, and we're going to be seeing some of those as we go through this talk this morning, this afternoon. Sharp, amongst his travelling to collect folk songs, starting in Somerset in 1903, he came across carols, and he started to publish them. And he put together a collection of folk carols, which he dedicated to Wraith Vaughan Williams. They'd been collaborating for some time with various um, publications. And in 1911, 
Um, he published these. Now I want you to have a look down this list and see if you recognise any of these. I'm guessing probably only a few, because we tend not to sing these now, and I'm not sure why. Um, the New Year's Carol, I've highlighted in red. I'm going to sing to you now because it's got an exquisite tune, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the singers behind it. Awake, awake, ye drowsy souls, and hear what I do tell. Remember Jesus Christ our Lord, redeemed our souls from hell. He's crowned with thorns, spears on, with scorn the Jews have hid themselves. So God send you all in a joyful new year, a new year. So God send you all in a joyful new year. Oh, thank you. Isn't that a beautiful melody? Absolutely beautiful. Well, here's Cecil Sharp's uh, field notebook where he actually um, wrote down the, uh, the words to that carol. And this comes from two singers. I want you to look at the bottom as well. You've got Walter Perry there written. This is the address of the next person he's going to see. And we'll come across him in a minute. So here's uh, Cecil Sharp's fair copy of the music of Awake, Awake, You Drowsy Souls. Now, when Sharp collected these carols, he was very diligent about his sources. So you'll see you've got Sam Bradley and Seth Vandrell of Lillishaw. You've got the date, October 27th, 1911. So with Sharp's collecting, we have this mass of data, which we can find out a lot more about our singers and the context they sang in. Now, we know that these two sang this together in unison, and there's a nice little story that goes with this. And Sharp says this in his preface to um, English folk carols. Christmas caroling is associated in the minds of folk singers with the custom of house-to-house -house singing. Only a few weeks ago, I asked two old men, and I believe it was these two, who were singing to me whether they knew a certain carol. One of them said that he did. The other, the elder of the two, shook his head doubtfully. Whereupon the younger singer stood up and dragging his companion up beside him said encouragingly, Stand up and think you've got snow in your boots. It'll come to you all right. <laughs> <coughs> and it did. And that tells us a little bit about context and about when you sing and why you sing and who you're with and how you sing. And this gentleman could only sing that carol when he was in the right context, which I think is quite interesting. Beautiful carol from Shropshire. Okay, we all know this one. This is, again, Sharpsfield Notes. Um, this is the tune of the Holly and the Ivy, which you'll recognise. Now, what you may not know is that the tune we know and love, this particular one, the Holly and uh, the Ivy, the one you know, is from Mrs Anna Clayton of Chipping Camden in Gloucestershire. These songs we learned at school, we never really thought about where they came from. I certainly didn't. And so what we've got here is a pure folk carol collected from the mouths of the people. And it's one that we know and love. Now, she actually was a chimney sweep, quite an interesting, you find her on the census. Um, but that tune is it's exactly the one that we sing today. We find it on broadsides. These carols clearly have an origin. The difference between the composed carols and the carols I'm talking about is that these are sort of a collective. They have a collective background. They go through the community and they come out the other side and they're enjoyed and shared. They're not written down on paper, they come through that oral tradition. However, they do have a point of origin, clearly. One of those points of origin are these broadsides. Um, here's one with a hole in the ivy. Um, this is a great website, by the way. If you're interested in broadsides and ballads, go to the Bodley, and they have a fantastic website on ballads. So here's one of the examples. So we're taking this carol back to the early 19th century. 
I particularly like the next board slide because of the typo. You might want to read down and have a look at the, uh, the chorus. He's clearly switched the, the, the words around the printer. The merry groan there instead of organ, I see. Um, but these things are wonderful. You know, they're printed on one side, but they have these words. They don't have tunes, so the tunes come from somewhere else. The words that Sharp took down from Mrs. Clayton are slightly different to that broadside, and this is where I think we really get close to the person, because get nearer to the vernacular, the language that people are using. And Sharp seems to us to be very diligent about taking down the words as the people spoke them. So if we read this, the holly and the ivy are both now well grown of all the trees that's in the world, the holly bears the crown. The holly bears the bark as bitter as any gall, and Mary bears sweet Jesus, child Christ, for <coughs> to redeem us all. The holly bears the berry as red as any blood, and Mary bears sweet Jesus Christ to do us sinners good. I like it. It's a vernacular poetry, and it takes us to the people, and I absolutely love it. Okay, which carol are we going to look at next, do you think? It is. I saw three ships. This has one of the most fascinating histories for me within the folk carol um, <coughs> canon, if you will. In William Sands' publication, Christmas Carols, Ancient and Modern, we, we find reference to this carol. It's an um, early 19th century of collection of carols that he purports to collect, although we don't have the sources. There are also some, definitely some improvisation and composition going on in here. He divides this into three parts. So we have ancient carols and Christmas songs, we have carols still used in the west of England, and some French provincial carols. This is about the time, remember, look at the day, 1833. Ten years later, we've got Dickens' Christmas Carol being published. So you're looking at a time when this book actually was becoming very, very popular, and a lot of people would have known the carols contained therein. So in it, we find in William Sanders' volume, the familiar um, carol that we know, I Saw Three Ships, and you see it on the first line there. The tune's the one that we know, familiar to us. However, the story behind this is really rather fascinating. In his uh, preface to that volume, Sanders cites Joseph Ritson, um, who's collected a version of, of the uh, three ships come sailing in. And this is what his words are. There comes a ship for sailing then, St. Michael and the steersmen. St. John sat in the horn, I the stern. Our law harped, our lady sang, and all the bells of heaven they rang on Christmas Sunday at morning. So it's one ship and a lot of people in it. So it's pretty crowded. Um, so we have this in that collection of Scottish songs by Ritson. So we're going back a little further. He says this was sung in the 16th century at Christmas time. So we're taking it back a little further. Now the plot thickens because we have this gentleman coming into the equation. This is Sabine Bering Gould again, who is the Vicar of Blue Trenchard. He was sent a version of this carol from a chap called Lewis Davis of Pinner, who was a friend of his. And Baring Gould published the version that he was sent in a publication he called A Garland of Country Songs in 1895. Now, this song was collected from a boatman on the River Humber, and it's a version of the carol about the three crawns. Now, the three crawns. Douglas Bryce, in his publication, The Folk Carol of England, associates crawns with the skull. And what he's talking about is the three magi, the three kings. So here we are, we've got a carol collected in, in the late um, 19th century on the Humber from a boatman about ships sailing in, which is quite interesting in its own right, um, about the Magi, and we're, so we're going back to a time of legend. Now, the legend associated with the three crawns in this particular carol is that 300 years after the death of the Magi, their bodies were taken to Constantinople by Entra Empress Helena, whose full name, for you Roman scholars out there, Flavia Julia Helena Augusta, she was around 250-330 AD, so we're talking about um, the late Roman Empire. 
mother of Constantine the Great. Now, these skulls were subsequently brought to Milan, apparently in an ox cart. It's always the details that fascinate me. How do they get that into the legend? It's wonderful, isn't it? By Eustorgius, who was the city's bishop. So he wanted relics. So they went to Milan, uh, where the emperor Constantine entrusted them to him. We're talking um, about 314 or so thereabouts. This is what's referred to in, in the sources. Then, subsequently, these relics of the Magi um, were taken by the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa and given to the Archbishop of Cologne. Um, eight centuries later, in 1164, in the 12th century. And in the legend, three ships transported them out of reverence, one skull in each ship. So you thought the three ships come sailing was about Mary and the baby Jesus, but we have this legendary association that it's possibly associated with the Magi which I think is absolutely fascinating. And we're finding this out through a collected carol on the Humber from a boatman that went to bearing gold. Here he is. This is the sort of boats that this chap would have been sailing in. These are Humber keels of the early 1900s. Those are sort of coastal barges that can go up a river. Um, he may be on one of these, who knows? We don't know his name. And this, I'm sorry it's rather small. This is the field notebook that Sabine Bering Gold recalls this carol in. It's a really jolly tune, and I want us to have a go. Do you fancy having a go at this? Okay. So the tune is this. I saw three ships come sailing in. I saw three ships come sailing in. Bye, bye, bye. I saw three ships come sailing in. You're looking a bit glum. <laughs> Bit glum. Right, okay, sit up. This is why I tell my chorus. I saw three ships come sailing in. Let's have another go. I saw three ships come sailing in. Next bit. I saw three ships come sailing in. Have a go. I saw three ships come sailing in. Bye, bye, bye. Have a go. Bye, bye. I saw three ships come sailing in. I saw three ships come sailing in. Do it again. I saw three ships come sailing in. I saw three ships come sailing in. Bye, bye, bye. I saw three ships come sailing in. The old tradition is alive in the antiquaries. I love it. I love it. So let's look at the other verses. This is the first one you've just sung. I asked them what they got aboard. They said they got three crowns. I asked them where they was taken to. They said they was ganging to Colne or Rhine, to Cologne, where the skulls ended up. I asked them where they came from. They said they came from Bethlehem. And this is the reliquary in Cologne where the Magi purports, the bones of the Magi purport to be laid. It's one of the biggest ones in Europe, I understand. It may even be the biggest. There'll be scholars here who can tell you, no doubt. So a wonderfully fascinating story between a carol we know and love, which is far more complicated than perhaps we have hitherto imagined. Okay, let's look at Wraith Vaughan Williams. Here's a song for those who are musical amongst you. See if you can uh, recognise that tune. This is the... Um, the Ploughboy's Dream, and it was sung by Mr. Garman, who was a labourer of Forest Green, which is near Ockley in, in Surrey, and uh, he was about 60 years old when Wraith Vaughan Williams collected this from him. I'm a ploughboy stout and strong as ever drove a team. Anyone recognise that? It is. It is indeed the tune of This Is The Tune. I am a ploughboy stout and strong as ever drove a team. This is where the tune comes from. It's actually a collected folk song. The English hymnal is full of them. Wraithful Williams was commissioned to produce a new hymnal with, with Percy Dearmer, um, 1907. And where would they go to find good tunes? Well, they'll go to folk songs. And that's what they did. So this tune was from the mouths of the people. This is where it came from. And you'll see it's called Forest Green, and that's what the name that Wraith Williams gave to the tune. It's the place it was collected from. 
I wish you'd put Mr. Garman's name on it, actually. That would have been much nicer for my mind, but there we are. There are others. Um, ah, a captain cried all hands to sail tomorrow, leaving many a fair pretty girl in grief and sorrow. What makes you go away fighting for strangers? When you could stop at home free from all dangers. So what's that? <laughs> or he who would valiant be. Or in the folk world, our captain cried all hands. And that tune was attached to the words of John Bunyan. So you start digging around and you find some very interesting associations. Um, so it's all very exciting for me. Okay, so that's the ploughboy's dream. There we are. So back to Cecil Sharp. Whilst Sharp was collecting these um, carols from people and various folk songs, he became aware of a particular type of singing gathering. And this is what he says in his introduction to English folk carols. In several parts of England, I found carols which are peculiar to certain villages, by the inhabitants of which they were regarded as private possessions of great value, to be jealously guarded and retained for their own use. These are not traditional folk carols, but the elementary compositions of simple musicians, very possibly of those who in the old days were members of the church bands. Bands like this, where people in the choir would actually play and sing together. You'd have the musicians all muddled in, very hardy-esque. You all know Under the Greenwood Tree, you've got the Melstock Band, you know, rough music on a Saturday night and in church on a Sunday morning playing the tunes and the hymns, etc. So these are the West Gallery choirs of the English rock tradition. Here's a lovely picture of the sort of thing that uh, Sharp's referring to, and another very famous image of the village choir by Thomas Webster. This is in the V&A. Um, so Sharp says these are not traditional folk carols, but the elementary composition of simple musicians, very possibly of those in the old days who were members of the church bands. They are easily distinguished from the popular carol by the formal nature of the music and words, and also back by the fact that many of them are written in parts. So as part of this caroling tradition amongst the people, we have, if you like, the solo singers, the sort of songs I've been looking at hitherto that people would join in with the choruses. And then you get these composed works, which are composed by local composers, arranged in parts. And this is what we like to term today as West Gallery style music. So this group caroling tradition, um, is very interesting. Sharp picks it up in the early 1900s, and what we're talking about when we dig deeper is over two and a half centuries of the performance of distinctive carols in particular villages, and they are guarded in those villages as their own distinctive carols. The one near me on X Ford, um, they have a set of carols there which are not allowed to go out of the village. Woe betide anyone who takes the carols out of the village. This tradition is very prevalent in the west of England, also particularly in South Yorkshire and Derbyshire around Sheffield. Has anyone been to any of the caroling up there? Fantastic. Would you like to describe it? Thank you, thank you. It is a wonderful, wonderful tradition. Um, it's all about group interaction. This is about part singing and there is also musical accompaniment. Sometimes it's quite complicated musical accompaniment, um, but it's about people singing together, so it's a slightly different tradition. This is also interesting. When we've moved out of the church and the chapel, we're in the village pub. This is the focus and the centre of this seasonal celebration. It's performed without musical direction because, as you've just heard, these are people who've sung these carols all their lives within their family and their community context. And they're untrained singers. They don't need music and words. They do everything orally. I thought you might like to hear an example of one from Exmoor. So this is the Dunster Carol. Um, this is actually sung in a formal concert. 
Um, but I love it because it gives you an impression of those four-part harmonies that are so wonderful. <coughs> Wish us luck with the link. I hear along the street past the minstrel throngs Hark a day so sweet from their hopeless Christmas songs Let us find the fire ever higher, ever higher Sing until the night expire, sing until the night expire In December ring, every day that chimes There is the Westmount Gallery Music Association. A lot of this stuff is now being recreated and people are digging deep into the manuscripts of their local village communities and finding these carols and recreating them with old instruments like the serpent, you know, the bass viol, etc. I myself actually once played an iron cello as part of this. That was terrifying. We got it from Stoke and Trent Museum. It's all pot riveted around the sides. I was terrified to tune it up to pitch because it all pinged out, you know. Um, but it was absolutely great fun because a lot of these things are homemade, you know, the carols are homemade and in the village if they haven't got a fiddle or a bass viol as they called it they would make one they'd get the old blacksmith to knock one up or they'd get the carpenter or the coffee maker to knock up a fiddle and you can still find these in parish churches around the countryside um, they're fascinating okay so i'm sorry i can't do a dunster carol but um do look it up on youtube you can uh, find it find it yourself for yourself so, this carol tradition in South Yorkshire, um, if you're interested, um, Ian Russell has published a really interesting book on the Sheffield um, carols, etc. Well worth reading. He's spent a long time studying these because they are quite a phenomenon in English um, folk carol um, genre. Um, the one I'm going to um, share with you, fingers crossed, is uh, at the Royal at Dunworth in west of Sheffield. And I'm going to see if this one will work, do you think? The Royal. On Christmas time a traveller, so long it's been his use. Called to spend his holidays and choose his Christmas news. All around the green woods, so early in the morn, the merry, merry huntsman moves his silver bugle horn. He drank his pint of sherry wine, he smoked a mild cigar. He chatted with the customers and people in the bar, but not a thought of wickedness ever entered in his head until the chambermaid appeared to light him up to bed. He kissed her at the chamber door before he said his prayers. He gave her a guinea to prevent her being vexed. And then he blew the candle out. And you can guess the rest. All around the green was so early in the morning. The merry, merry huntsman blows his silver. some very interesting sort of rules and regulations if you go to one of these sessions because if you were to introduce for example a carol that they don't normally sing they tell you in Yorkshire terms we don't sing that one here <laughs> you know so they are very particular traditions okay let's um, move on from the Yorkshire caroling tradition I want to say a little bit about um, the sorts of songs that were being celebrated this time, because not all of them were jolly and seasonal and wonderful. Um, some of those that were considered as carols by the people who sang them were, let's say, stern and even somewhat vengeful. Um, 
The emphasis was on morality and mortality. And I'm going to give you the words of one which absolutely beggars belief. This is from Joseph Hart's Hart's Hymns from the 18th century. He was a Calvinist minister in London. And this is the, these are the carol words. I will leave you to, to read these. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> And even better. Oh, well, there's redemption at the end. The Saviour is born. Hooray, after all that. So, you know, these are the sort of things that are in circulation. And uh, it's absolutely wonderful to find this sort of material. I'm going to take you to Somerset now. Um, this is why I've done most of my research looking at Cecil Sharp's singers, and that's really the focus of what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the context of these carols, who sang them, where they sang them, why they sang them, who was with them, etc., etc. So we're moving over there to, to meet one of Cecil Sharp's singers. This is Harry Richards. Um, Harry, this is one of Cecil Sharp's photographs. Cecil Sharp took a wonderful um, collection of photographs, um, amassed a wonderful collection of his singers, and all of his singers are represented in his collection. Um, but what Sharp did, and I think they're rather fine portraits, is that he liked to give an impression in the portraits that he took of these singers of what they did and who they were. So here we have Harry Richards of the village of Curry Rival, which is between um, the town of some, uh, Taunton and Langport, who is a gardener. As you can see, he's got his um, basket of potatoes, he's got his fork, he's just dug up his nice, like, nice new potatoes there. Probably a local made basket, the basket industry is a big part of the Somerset um, sort of industries on the Somerset levels. I particularly like his beard, I think the facial hair in these photographs is fascinating. Beards are in again, aren't they? So here's an interesting idea. Um, what I also love about these photographs is I think if you're a historian of costume, these are fascinating because these are the clothes that do not survive in our museum collections. The good and the great, the courtly robes are there. Here we have the clothes of the poor, which get made into what? Hand-me-downs, cleaning cloths, rag rugs, etc. They disappear. Here we have a collection which is actually very interesting for the costume historian, I think. Anyway, here's Harry Richards, um, a great singer that um, Cecil Sharp met in Kerry Rival. And the song that I want to share with you today is a wassail song. Now, again, this is all part of that collection of Christmas caroling. Who in this room has done some wassailing? Oh, excellent. Whereabouts? <coughs> Where were you? The globe. Wow, okay. At the back. Fantastic. Fantastic. Here? Um, I was at the globe. Uh, at the globe? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Over there, there were some hands. Herefordshire. So the fruit side of <coughs> growing areas. There were some hands over here. Okay, what did you do on your wassail? I'm guessing it was an apple tree wassail. I'm guessing that you probably did things like beat up the trees, made a lot of noise, sang a song, libation of cider around the roots, all that sort of thing, yes? Okay, so this is very much part of traditions in the West Country associated with Christmas singing. And we have two sorts of wassails. There's the travelling wassail, which you will know People go from house to house with a wassail bowl, perhaps farm to farm, in the hope of getting some food, some money, and a sort of saying thank you very much to the farmer for their employment during the year, and so on and so forth. And then there's the apple tree wassail. Now this particular song, which has got a fantastic tune, is from Curry Rival, and it's one that was sung locally um, as part of one of those sort of travelling wassails. Um, here's the tune. You might find some nuances here that you recognise, some, some similarities with a, a well-known carol. This is some... Um, wassail and wassail all over the town The carpet is white and the ale it is brown The carpet is made of the good old ashen tree and so is the beer of the best barley to you a wassail. I and Jolly come to a jolly wassail. Very modal. It feels quite ancient, doesn't it, when you sing it. 
a wonderful tune. And this is part of a family of wassails from that area, which went, meant to have lovely verses like the girt dog of Langport, he burnt his girt tail. You know, <laughs> what is that about? We don't know. Um, so, um, the, again, these songs, the tunes are wonderful. Sometimes the words get mashed up through that tradition of, of passing them on, but even so, they're, they're still worth having. So this is uh, Harry Richards' wassail. That wassail carried on to the 1950s. Dare I press that button in the top left-hand corner and hope some sound comes out. Um, so this is a recording from that period. Now, I don't know if you can see at the top of that picture, there's a, a chap um, leering at you from above with some lights around. Well, he's in the Warsaw apple tree. And this is what you did. Um, you put children in the Warsaw in the tree with toast soaked in cider into the branches to appease the good spirits, so the little robins and the things that were good for the tree, that was a sort of offering, if you will. And around the roots, you'd put cider, you put children in the trees, you shot guns into the trees, not at the same time, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so again, drive away the bad spirits, and, um, and all these, and then you would walk around the trees singing a wassail song. Um, so here's the Curry Rival wassailers in the 1950s. Let's keep our fingers crossed on this one, Renee. said god bless the master and missus of this house and happy christmas and a happy new year so it's very much about going and um, appreciation for you know the laborers and the farming that sort of interaction is being celebrated there what they also did at cory rival which is interesting they called william the fourth pub which is where that was recorded and they still do wassail there is they have this thing called the ashen faggot whereby they have um faggots of wood and they bind them round with hazel and each time a binding pops then the master has to buy a, a round for everybody. So uh, the more they get round it, the better, they, the happier they was sailors be. Um, so the burning of that is, is quite an interesting Somerset tradition, and that still happens there. So that's the Curry Rival Wassailers. They are singing Harry Richard's song, but what they've done, you'll hear the tune has changed from that very sort of modal, sort of, sort of quite somber, ancient sound to something a bit jollier and a bit more major in key. Um, and that's the old tradition, and that's why I love it. It's a slippery beast, it moves around. Yes, yes it is, yes. <coughs> Wonderful. Yeah, there is quite a lot of was wassail vessels actually associated. There's plenty of uh, turned wassail bowls and so on. We're going to see another one in a minute. Thank you. Right, I'm going to go to the full screen now for this. So we're looking at midwinter. We're looking at fires in the orchards. We're looking at solstice star sort of customs. Um, here we are, libating the apple tree, putting a nice lot of cider around it, sticking the toast in the branches. I've actually officiated at three of these now, and um, people keep asking me to do the songs and so forth, because they are becoming increasingly popular in rural areas, and I know that they do one in Leeds now, they do an urban wassail, and it's a tradition that's starting to rise up again, which is quite interesting. Now, the, the song associated with it, oh, and then you beat up the tree a lot as well to, uh, to wake it up. <laughs> Apparently that's what's going on there. The apple tree wassail song is different from the one. It's very simple that I've just, we just heard, and it's the one in Somerset, the Sussex Sharp collected, is 
Old apple tree, we're wassailing and hoping thou wilt bear. The Lord doth know where we shall be to be merry another year. To blow well and to bear well and so merry let us be. Let every man drink up his cup and a health to the old apple tree. To blow well and to bear well and so merry let us be. Let every man drink up his cup and a health to the old apple tree. So they're lovely tunes. Um, there's also another tradition to do associated with wassailing, which, as we, as we say in Gloucestershire, wassailing. I'm a Gloucester girl, so we talk about wassailing in Gloucestershire. And here you have a set of wassailers with a very interesting character in the middle, and that is the broad. And the broad is a man dressed up as a cow, and the broad could be taken around with the wassailers as well. Now, the chap on the right-hand side, you might just be able to work out, he's got, there's a, look, looks like a tree with lots of ribbons on it. It's, it's actually a wassail bowl, and he's put some branches in it to decorate it. So he's carrying around the wassail bowl. They've got their cider. These are your wassailers from Tetbury in the 1930s. Now, they're singing very different sorts of songs out there, and I love the Gloucestershire wassails, wassails because um, there's one particular that celebrates the cows, which is <laughs> lovely. So, for example, you've got... Um, gosh, which one is it? And here is to broad May, and to her broad horn, may God send our master a good crop of corn, a good crop of corn that may we all see. With a wassailing bowl we'll drink to thee. You know the chorus? We sail, we sail all over the town. Our cup it is white and our ale it is brown. Our bowl it is made of the white maple tree. With a wassailing bowl we'll drink to thee. So again, all sorts of dimensions to, to the Christmas way cell. And I particularly love this photograph. I hope they collected some money. They... You can get merchandise. <laughs> it's so popular now. You put way sailing on a Google search, you can buy your own way sailing shirt. There we go. And all sorts of people are involved in it nowadays. You never know <laughs> who's going to get engaged in this wonderful activity. <laughs> However, I just want to say a little bit, I've given you a little sort of insight, a little glimpse into the world of folk song and folk caroling. Um, it's a huge subject because it's very regional and very local. Villagers have their own particular carols. I do urge you to go and do some of your own research. There is a most wonderful website that you need to visit and it's the English Folk Dance and Song Society's Full English. The Full English. It's a digital archive and what they've done is they've digitised quite a lot of these collections of the people I showed you earlier on, these, these collectors, and they've put them online. They've scanned and digitised these images. So if you, you might put in a Chipping Sodbury or a village where you're from, and you might find some singers and some songs that you didn't know existed. And this material is all there for you. When I was first researching this, I had to trawl up to Cecil Sharp House and do that thing you do in an archive whereby, you know, the time's ticking on, you're trying to get it all done and it's five to five and you still haven't got it all done. The researchers know what I mean amongst us, you know, it's that horrible panic stations. And now I can go in the luxury of my home and research it online and it's pure bliss. So please do check out the English Folk Dance and Song Society's digital archive, Google the full English and have some fun. Now, there's a little, couple of little tail pieces to this talk. Um, one of the lovely songs that Sharp collected was called The Months of the Year. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. January's the first month, the sun goes very low. I went out in the farmyard, the cattle fed on straw. The weather being so cold, the snow lies on the ground. There will be an alteration before the year comes round before the year comes round. At the back of the room is my daughter, and that song was sung to Cecil Sharp by her great-great-great-grandmother, which was a pure pleasure to research that and find out that even within my own family, and I don't have a Somerset bone in my body, that that connection is there. And I urge you to do the same, because we all have singing ancestors. And through the diligence and research of these wonderful collectors that I've been speaking about today, we know who some of them are. And you may well find that within your own family tree, you have one of these singers that these collectors collected from. 
Um, a place you can go is I published a series with a colleague of mine, Dr Chris Beerman, of folk maps. And as was mentioned at the beginning, we've published folk maps for Gloucestershire, Somerset and Hampshire. And we've found out the names of these singers that were, that were collected from in those counties. And they're in those maps and there's a list of them and the villages they came from and the dates they were collected from. You can get these online, you can visit my website, yvettestamens.com, you can go on Bournemouth University website and find folk maps for Somerset, Hampshire and Gloucestershire. So I do urge you to go and find out if you've got a singing ancestor there, because we're all part of this heritage. Our ancestors sang, that's what they did, on a daily basis. Now, I've shown you this last slide because the folk tradition never ends. Some years ago, Someone sang a wonderful song to me that is a midwinter song called The White Hair. She learned that song from somebody else, who learned it from somebody else, who learned it from someone called Pip. And that's all we know about this person. Um, so I, if you like, have received this through that process of oral tradition. I believe this song because whenever I sing it, people want it, they take it on. I do know it's been sung in West Africa, would you believe? Already it's out there which shows the tradition is alive and, alive and kicking. And I'm going to sing it to you as an example that the folk carol and the folk tradition is still extant. Um, this celebrates, if you will, the midsummer, sorry, the midwinter solstice, the, the notion of the birth of the sun, the reawakening of the earth. So it's quite pagan in content, um, but this is the white hair. Do you see the white hair? Standing still for a moment, there are footprints there. Underneath the earth, the lady is sleeping, and the lord of the wood is waiting. Do you see the white hair? Standing still for a moment, there are footprints there. Underneath the earth, the lady is stirring, and the lord of the wood is making the table ready. And the lord of the wood is waiting. Do you see the white hair standing still for a moment? There are footprints there. Underneath the earth, the lady is rising. Feel the lady rising. See the lady rise. And the Lord of the Wood. And the Lord of the Wood. And the Lord of the Wood is ready. Thank you.